let's look at another passage that was never part of the original Gospel of John. Oops, did I say passage? What I meant to say was entire chapter. That's right, the entire 21st chapter of John is a later addition by someone other than the original author. It follows what is obviously the original summary ending at the end of chapter 20. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The End The reason the 21st chapter was added was to retrofit current Christian tradition and theology back into the Gospel of John. One of the goals achieved by adding the 21st chapter was to provide a pretext for why Jesus had not yet returned from heaven as he had promised. In passages such as Mark 13.30, Jesus predicts his second coming as occurring before his current generation passes away. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. In another passage, Mark 14.62, he says that he will return and the high priest himself, Caiaphas, will see it. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. By the early second century, it was evident to even the most stubborn apologists that Jesus was not coming back within the time frames he had promised. By the start of the second century, both this generation and the high priest Caiaphas had long passed away. But there was one other promise by Jesus that was seen by Christians as a last hope to salvage a returning Jesus. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. The idea was simple. If we could create a narrative showing Jesus ascribing immortality to one of his disciples, then as long as that disciple was alive, Jesus' prediction would still be alive and valid. The 21st chapter of John accomplishes just this. It shows Jesus ascribing a sort of immortality to John so that Jesus could return any time in the future. And as long as John remained alive, Jesus' promise that at least one person would still be alive when he returned, remained alive. The language style of the 21st chapter is not radically different from the rest of John, but it does contain some words not found in the rest of the Gospel. But here are a few more points that argue for a later addition to the original. First of all, the continuity of the narrative is completely broken. Whereas in chapter 20, the disciples are commanded to spread the gospel and they are given a literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit by Jesus breathing on them. But in chapter 21, we find them apparently ignoring this eternally important imperative and spending their day fishing for fish instead of fishing for men. Chapter 20 seems to put forth the idea of blind faith as a virtue. But chapter 21 has Jesus performing yet another miracle to sort of prove that he was the risen Lord. Another oddity, John 21, 24 brings in a plural suddenly. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Switching from third person singular to first person plural. This smells of a later insertion to be sure. Perhaps the people fabricating the 21st chapter were worried that their new add-on would be rejected, so they had to include the bit that in fact this add-on was written by none other than the original author. And I suppose they felt the need to add the we, because in those days, an agreement between two or more people was as good as video confirmation. Another argument for a later edition is that the original ending to John 
at the end of chapter 20, ends like this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. The ending of chapter 21 copies this same idea, but improves upon it. But there are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. It's always important to one-up your literary predecessor. And even though there are no manuscripts in existence that are missing the 21st chapter, it's obvious that this was never part of the original. The original ending was left intact as we have seen, and the chapter attempts to fix a problem that could only have begun to be seen as a problem after the first century had passed. And at that time, it would have been abundantly clear that all of Jesus' contemporaries were all dead and gone. This helps to explain why we have no copies of John without it. It was added very early on, most likely sometime during the first half of the second century. And interestingly enough, Church Father Tertullian, in his apologetic attack called Against Praxius, references many verses from John's Gospel in sequence and in a way that clearly shows he had a written copy of his own to draw from. And just after quoting John 20, 17, Tertullian writes concerning what he calls the conclusion of the Gospel. And wherefore does this conclusion of the Gospel affirm that these things were written unless it is that you might believe? It says that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Tertullian is apparently unaware that there was a chapter 21, for he calls chapter 20 the conclusion of John's Gospel. This seems to confirm the idea that chapter 21 was an addition to the original Gospel and that, in fact, Tertullian, almost to the third century, had one of the earlier copies of John without chapter 21. Unfortunately, none of those earlier copies have survived. In the Gospel of Luke, we read the familiar words of Jesus at the Last Supper. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after supper, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But as familiar as these words sound, were they also a later insertion into Luke's Gospel? Fact. Many Bible translations mention that verse 19b, the second half of verse 19, and verse 20 are omitted from some early manuscripts. Is it just me or is it odd that the early manuscripts are always the ones which are missing these passages? Again, we know that stories grow in the telling. They almost never shrink in the telling, and almost without exception, the reason for an omitted passage in the early manuscripts is that it was never there to begin with. We can clearly understand why this is a later insertion. The doctrine of the Eucharist, or communion, that is, Jesus' symbolic references to the cup of wine and bread actually being a ritual that he instituted to be held periodically in his memory, is a later theological development. It is not found in the earlier Gospel accounts of Mark or Matthew, and apparently not found in the early manuscripts of Luke either. It seems the ritual of the Eucharist was built upon a saying that Jesus never actually said. In Mark's version of the Great Commission, Jesus makes some unbelievable claims about his followers. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. But Christians should be relieved to know that these verses are absent from many existing manuscripts of Mark and were never part of the original story.
The original Gospel of Mark ended at verse 8 of chapter 16, as I showed earlier in this series. See parts 2 and 3 of this series for an in-depth look at why this is so. Here are a few more passages that were never part of the original Bible. Luke 22, 43, and 44 were never part of the original Gospel of Luke. Jesus' sweat is likened to drops of blood falling. The explicit doctrine of the Trinity found in 1 John 5, 7 was inserted into that epistle at a later time when the concept of the Trinity had finally congealed into a popular and widely accepted doctrine. John 5, 4, which describes an angel disturbing the waters, which thereby granted the first poor soul to stumble, crawl, or roll into the pool, the fortuitous state of being whole again was never part of the Gospel of John. But closer to home, another two post-resurrection verses in Luke were inserted later. Luke 24, 12, which depicts Peter entering Jesus' tomb, and Luke 24, 51, which depicts Jesus blessing his disciples and then flying up through the air to get back to heaven. And these are just a few of the many embellishments that could be put on the table. With numerous instances of clear embellishment and later remodeling, sometimes even entire scenes and chapters, we cannot be entirely sure what is or isn't original, but worse, we cannot feel confident that even what was original was historical. The fact that the Gospels have been altered for theological reasons and even entire chapters added spotlights their historical unreliability, for we cannot be sure that even what we consider the core details have not been altered along the way and with hundreds of years of copying underlying our earliest manuscripts, it's almost certain that they have. Nothing is created in a vacuum. Check out Bart Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus for a great explanation of the manuscript evidence regarding who changed the Bible and why. In the next video, we'll look at another serious problem for the historical reliability of the resurrection as we compare the four post-resurrection accounts. See you there.